So welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. And um, On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries related to the built environment. Today we have an author's forum, Building an Affordable House, second edition, with author Fernando Pahe Reese. The interviewer is myself, uh, Rob Studeville, and I'm really looking forward uh, to this conversation today. So share your thoughts on hashtag on the park bench, www.tinyurl.com slash OTPB feedback. <clears throat> and uh, today we have a home builder, developer, and author, Fernando Pahe Ruiz, and he has developed affordable housing in California, the Midwest, and the mountain states. His projects have won numerous awards, including the Green Building Single Family House of the Year and the Workforce Housing Award from the National Association of Home Builders. He is the author of several books on affordable housing and is, is an urbanist who has become familiar, a familiar figure at CNU, often speaking on, uh, from a developer's perspective. Um, he is currently working with Andreas Duani on the design of neighborhoods for Latino immigrants and today we're discussing Building an Affordable House, the second edition, Trade Secrets to High Value, Low Cost Construction. Uh, this book was an ambitious project uh, when the first edition came out in 2005. Since then, Fernando has become immersed in the new urbanism and has incorporated much of what he's learned into the new edition. More importantly, affordable housing has become far more urgent um, in recent years. Our nation has gone through massive economic changes. No housing issue is more important than affordable housing today. As I write in my recent review, this book is refreshingly free of jargon and dogma. I think it's a must read for small developers or really any developers. It uh, provides a foundation for the choices that you uh, uh, have in reducing cost while retaining quality. I'm Rob Studeville, editor of CNU's Public Square online journal. Uh, first, there's going to be a presentation by Fernando, then a brief discussion uh, with Fernando and myself, and then Q&A from the audience. So please be ready to use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask your questions as they occur to you. Uh, so uh, welcome, Fernando, to On the Park Bench. I'm going to pass this along to you for a presentation. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, uh, Rob. I really appreciate the introduction and your uh, absolutely wonderful um, review that you did of the book. Very intelligent review, perhaps the most uh, most intelligent review I have ever uh, <laughs> I have ever uh, seen of the book. So, thank you very much for that. And I'm going to uh, start the slideshow here at the beginning this time. Thank you, and that's a uh, the uh, what what a picture you you uh, you chose for my image here at the introduction, <laughs> but uh, but thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. This is a great audience, and I sure appreciate everyone that's attending. And I and thank you, Hillary, for the very nice comment uh, on, in the chat. Um, just by way of uh, self credentialing a little bit for those of you that don't know me, I am. Uh, I have been in the sort of home building uh, world for a good 40 years. You're never supposed to cop to more than 20 years. You know, that, that discredits you immediately when you when you go beyond 20 years. But since my first book was published 20 years ago, it'd be hard for me to pull that one off. Um, I have always been doing affordable home building primarily, not because I aimed at that uh, when I started out, but simply because I wasn't uh, very wealthy. I was poor. So all the projects I did were on a poor man's budget, including the building my first house in a very sketchy neighborhood in Los Angeles. And that's where I and began. Uh, Fernando, if, uh, did you put your slides up? Uh, or... My slide are up. They should be. I thought I was uh, sharing my screen, but let me uh, let me go back to screen share. Let's see. It, uh... I didn't want them to miss the first slide. Okay, I will go all the way back to the beginning then. For some reason, um, I um, it's a little hard because of all the different things going on at the screen at one time. So I'm looking here for the 
for the, there we go. Now, what's going on? Now, what slide are you seeing? You're I'm not seeing a slide. You have to go back and I think share screen at the bottom. Yeah, I thought I have done that now a couple of times. Uh, let me uh. start all over again. There you go. Are you seeing my first slide or are you seeing... I'm uh... seeing the first slide, but I'm seeing your whole window. So uh, you need to start okay. the slideshow. Or... Yeah, let's start the slideshow. There we go. There is we that go. right now? That Good. is. I apologize. I actually hate it when presenters aren't ready and know what they're doing. And usually I do, but, you know. <laughs> so as I was saying, um, by way of... Uh, self-credentialing. I've spent a long time in the building trades uh, since I was young. And I um, found one day uh, when I was uh, developing in Los Angeles that a lot of my friends and colleagues were uh, really progressing in their careers, building very expensive homes, re re tearing down uh, uh, million dollar homes to build $10 million homes in Santa Monica. And I was jealous, you know, I was like, wow, I'm doing these little crummy little houses in the Mexican neighborhood. And these guys are, 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 are so far ahead of me until a great recession came in about 19, 1989, 1990. And they were all wiped out. American Beauty Homes, a big developer wiped out. And I wasn't, I was still building and going on. And at that point I realized, you know, well, maybe what I'm doing isn't such a bad idea. Maybe it's actually a good business plan. And so I started doing it very consciously, looking for inexpensive land, building inexpensive homes and selling them. And I actually got pretty good at it. Um, eventually a recession came to Los Angeles. I moved to the Midwest. I had never actually built for white people. I was always in kind of a Hispanic context. And I, I learned how to build for white people by going to a group out of of uh, Michigan that had built a very inexpensive house, a $90,000 house. Why? Well, because the realtors challenged the home builders in, in, um, in this city saying, hey, we've got the first million dollar house in our town. We've got all these high-end homes, but what we really need is a $90,000 house. The home builder said it can't be done. And so the realtors published in the newspaper, the challenge, do it. And they got together a group of home builders and uh, tradespeople and designed a $90,000 house. And after they did that, one of the guys, the guy who kind of acted as general contractor of the house, started building it all the time and uh, doing quite well uh, with it. He discovered that it was much easier to build three or four of these than one big one. And I went and met with him. Uh, he lent me his plans. I took those plans, I modified them a bit, and I began to build. Why? Well, because they were kind of Midwestern type plans, and it was a four-bedroom, 1,600-square-foot house that I developed, uh, improved on the plan, did the same practice that they had done, got all my subs together to work on the plan and see how to do it, and we were selling it for $75,000 a year at the time. Well, Fine Home Building, a magazine I wrote for, because I've been writing for magazines for a very long time, uh, they were interested in how I did it. You know, well, how do you, how do you build a house for $75,000? And one of their editors came to visit me and I explained to him the whole process and they were really entranced uh, by it, by the thinking, not by the results. They didn't like the house in particular, but they really liked the approach, asked me to write an article about it. They put that article in the back and shortened it thinking it wouldn't really appeal to their readers. Well, 
It turns out it was the second most popular article they'd ever published. The most popular article they ever published was the Not So Big House uh, by Sarah Susanka that launched her book series. Well, the promise of the Not So Big House was a fantastically beautiful home that wouldn't cost that much, right? That was the promise. It wasn't true because Sarah's houses actually cost a lot of money to build, but that was kind of the premise with the Not So Big House. Spend it on beautiful things rather than on square footage. Well, it turns out it wasn't that simple, but my house was really designed to be affordable and it became the second most popular article. A lot of people wrote in. So they hired me and they said, hey, we'd like you to do a book on it. Realizing I couldn't do a whole book on just what I did, I, um, I, I coaxed them into giving me a travel budget and I went to every major market in the United States and I looked on the newspaper to find who was the, selling the least expensive homes in the city. And I went and visited them and talked to them. And sometimes they had a value engineering vice president like Pulte had or a whole department dedicated to reducing cost. And I learned a lot of techniques from these guys on how to do it, which I incorporated and added to what I had been doing myself. Now, that was 20 years ago. Okay. And I, you know, I've done a lot of living between now and then. And one of the big, big things was my engagement with the Congress for the New Urbanism, the organization. Uh, this led to um, my learning a lot and beginning to think a lot more about land use and uh, neighborhood planning and how that affordable house integrates into, you know, the balance of its context within the neighborhood. And one of the things that came out of that uh, is a book that I wrote with Corkett Onoran, uh, which is called Architectural Design for Traditional Neighborhoods. And it really could be called Traditional Neighborhoods on the Cheap, if you want, because it really does kind of strip down what are the essentials and how they can be accomplished affordably. And it's a book that came out of inspiration of Corkett's work with D.R. Horton, who had a very hard time understanding new urbanism, as, as Corkett tried to uh, explain it to him. Corkett is a um, architect and urbanist out of uh, Boulder, Colorado, teaches at the University of Colorado, and has as clientele some national builders. And this little book he thought would help him explain. It's like a you know it's like about the length of a romance model and written in plain language, and so the builders could digest the concepts. And um, and I think you know between the two books, which I have up on the screen, kind of encapsulates what's happened between the first edition and the second edition, and where I focus more on design, uh, in addition to all of the trade secrets, if you will, that go into um, building an affordable house. So that article that I told you about, the one that came out in Fine Home Building, I did in 2001. By 2005, I'd finished the first edition of the book. And in 2008, I attended my first CNU in Austin, and I had my first speaking gig at CNU in 2009, the following year. And that's when I met Andres Duany. I, um, I got a call. And I said, you're going to be on a panel, but you're going to go right after Andres. Nobody can go after Andres. You're going to have to be in your best uh, <laughs> game. You have to put the everything uh, down because uh, he's so good and nobody, if you go after him, you're just done. Well, I got the call about 45 minutes before I had to speak, so I didn't really have a chance to do a lot of prep work. I just went, and I did it, and I blew the room away. And afterwards, Andres came up to me and said, who are you? And I want to talk to you. And thereupon began a relationship which has lasted since 2009 to date. Uh, and we collaborate now on a lot of things, in particular on construction technology. Construction technology is what I focus on when I give kind of this presentation to home builders. And when I say construction technology, I mean really, really nuts and bolts stuff. I talk about alternative foundation systems, about advanced framing, about alternative mechanical, electrical, and plumbing system, about how to achieve high-end looking finishes on the cheap. And I really go into the kind of detail, and I'll show you just an example, because I'm not going to do that today. We're going to talk about design. We're not going to talk about trades. But I want to just give you kind of an example of what I'll do. For example, if I'm talking about framing, okay, that's a very wasteful area in construction, as you can see in the picture. When I begin talking about framing, I talk, of course, about advanced framing techniques, what we used to call OVE, or Optimal Value Engineering. Advanced framing is a lumber sparing approach to framing a building where you use less lumber. You use less lumber because you space studs out 
wider, like a 24 inches rather than 16. You don't use the same header. That's the the lintel or the, the the structural element about windows and doors. You don't use the same one throughout the house. You you make sure that the one you're using on a particular opening is the one that the structure requires and no more. You do a lot of things to use a lot less lumber, okay? So it's a lumber sparing technique that was developed in the 1970s. And although now it's embraced by green builders, it wasn't a green building technique. In the 1970s, we had the same problem we have today, which is that interest rates were very high. They weren't high like 6% like they are today. They were 18%. And builders really had to figure out how to deliver a very inexpensive house for anyone to be able to buy one. So they uh, did a lot of research at the time. The National Association of Home Builders, HUD, et cetera, collaborated, really scientific research, and came up with many, many, many great techniques on reducing the cost of housing. Now, some of those techniques today are green building techniques. They weren't originally. They were building cheap. And um, we've gone pretty far with that, and it's actually a fairly well-known approach now to framing, but there's more that can be done, and there's a lot of things that are in the in the codes, in the building codes, that neither builders nor developers use, and for the most part, architects completely ignore. And one expensive element in a house is what you're looking at right now, which is the sheathing, the exterior sheathing, the exterior wood sheathing. In this case, it's oriented strand board, OSB. That's the most common, okay? That's very expensive. It cost a lot of money to put all that plywood, if you will, on the house, especially when that uh, skyrockets in price. It's a commodity and it does occasionally do that. It's like gold, you know, it goes up and down in, in, in value. And when there's a big storm and a lot of people are buying it to board up windows and protect their projects and roofs get blown off in the storm, OSB or plywood sheathing goes way up in price. So what do you do? Well, a typical wall construction is uh, done with two by six studs with a layer of sheathing, OSB is the most common, and then an R19 insulation. This is a common wall for a lot of the USA, and it costs about $60 more or less a lineal foot. My wall, the approach that I use and, and teach in the class with the uh, uh, builders is a two by four wall, this traditional two by four wall. Instead of wood sheathing, I use a foam sheathing with an R5, in other words, a foam sheathing with an insulating value, such that when I put the insulation in that two by four wall, I only need to use a, a, a smaller uh, level of insulation or R15. Between the R15 and the R5, I got R20. I'm actually exceeding the standard wall, and plus that exterior layer of insulation works much better than just between the studs and the wall cavity. So this is a great wall from an insulation perspective, but you ask, where's the structure? Because that sheathing gives a lot of structure to the house. It gives us its shear value. That's its, its resistance to uh, wind and, and earth movement and things like that. It's a great material. It's a great way to build a house. Well, here's something that you can look up. It's in the code, but very few builders. I've never actually met anyone but some engineers that know about it, which is that you could use half inch drywall for the same purpose. You just have a different nailing schedule. Normally the drywall is nailed up at 16 inches. On center, they set the nails. Well, we set it at seven inches instead. It's in the IRC, the International Residential Code. There's a table that shows you, it's called the Jip Board Brace Wall Method. I use technique, but it's method in the code. There's a lot that you'll find in the codes that architects typically ignore that really can help you reduce the price of a house. You're going to put drywall up on the interior walls anyway. Just nail it a little bit more tightly, and suddenly you can omit the OSB or the exterior sheathing. Now, this is something that's done in places like New Zealand and Canada commonly, but here in the United States, for some reason, it's done very rarely. People ignore it. So this is the sort of thing I will teach builders, you know, how to mine the coal, the codes uh, for labor saving and, and material saving techniques. We always think, oh, the codes are getting harder. They're getting more complicated. They're, they're, they keep, every three years, they add more. It's true. They are getting more complicated, but that's because it has a lot more options. And it's in those options that you find affordability. It takes a little bit to use 
uh, this type of a technique. You have to know where the, you know, where, where the wind pressures are going to be on the house and exactly how to, you know, you know, design your uh, wall bracing strategy. You have to know how to deal with the portal walls. There's a number of things that go into it. It's not just so simple as nailing up the drywall with seven inch on centers, but I teach you how to do that in the course. And then I show you how much money I have saved on a typical house just from the alternative of going with foam board instead of OSB. In other words, going with a, an inexpensive foam sheathing instead of the wood based sheathing. And it's a significant amount of money. And this is just one trade and one element in the trade. If you begin to add them all up, foundations, all the different things you can do with um, with the framing, with the mechanicals, with the plumbing, with the electrical. Well, you end up saving a lot of money on a house. <laughs> and people are always telling me, and I've heard again and again, oh, it makes no difference. This approach really makes no difference. It's really all about land value. It's really all about zoning. It's really all about we have to put an ADU. Well, all that's great, but it's not true. You can do a lot in the hard cost construction um, area to reduce the price of a house or reduce the cost of a house. But we're not going to talk about the trades. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, kind of the, the the design approach. First of all, uh, we've got a problem we're all very aware of. Uh, in the last like three, four years, uh, house prices have gone up like 40%. Um, there's a big decline in housing starts, especially at, for the lower priced houses. There's almost uh, no construction now of lower priced houses, although builders have started to because nobody's able to buy their expensive houses. They've run out of rich people. And so they're having to find that really large market of people that aren't so rich. And the Urban Land Institute, from where I got these little quotes, uh, thinks that the way to go about it is to explore alternative construction techniques. And they emphasize things like offsite modular construction, which I'll address briefly. But for me, that isn't it. It really is exploring alternative construction techniques. Sometimes they're not so alternative. Sometimes they're techniques that we've just forgotten about. Now, one thing that folks have been doing is, of course, building much smaller homes. And here you have some examples. Now, I bet you can't guess who the developer is and builder of these homes. This is from Lennar, one of the biggest home builders in the nation, Lennar. And they build these... Uh, I don't know, I assume they build them all over the country, but I've seen them in Austin and Houston and San Antonio. They're around 300,000 in Austin, 200,000 in, in the Houston area. They're on very narrow lots. They're very narrow homes. They're quite small. I think like maybe 900 square feet, 800 square feet between both floors. Um, very simply built. Um, they're not a super attractive house, but you know what? A big market for them. No garage, you see just a driveway to park your car. So park cars all in front of all these houses in the neighborhood, exactly what a new urbanist would not like. However, there is such a strong need for affordable housing that not only is it a good market uh, opportunity, it's, I think, a moral imperative. I think it's a moral imperative to provide affordable homes. And the smaller houses, uh, people have been surprised to see that you could build homes at 800 square feet and they sell. Uh, there's a fellow in North Carolina, um, just interviewed and did an article on uh, that he's uh, he's built some net zero homes at around two hundred thousand dollars or eight hundred square foot each, and the you know the city council when seeing his project said nobody's going to buy an eight hundred square foot house without a garage. Well, guess what? They sold out. This has been proven again and again that price drives the market because today it is so difficult for people to get into a house that, like I said. This is a moral responsibility to provide homes that people can afford. If you have a nation of people starving, you don't get too prissy about the quality of the food, the local ingredients, the foie gras, the fine uh, dining has to go out when people are starving. And I see people are starving for housing in the United States, which is why I advocate for and focus on affordable housing. And the first thing you have to avoid if you want to build affordable housing, is what I call cheap washing. Cheap washing, I mean, is using a strategy where you think of some very complicated story to explain why your house is very inexpensive, even though it's expensive. So, for example, we have a $450,000 townhouse, a row house, small one, and uh, the developer and the architect present a big, you know, 
lecture on it. They're at CNU and they're explaining, well, this, these house, townhouses are right near uh, transit. They're very close to rail. So they're really inexpensive because you could live in this house without a car. And if you don't have a car, you've got a $10,000 savings per year because that's about the average annual cost of a car. At $10,000 a year, over a 30-year mortgage, that's $300,000 you've saved. That means this house is not $450,000, it's $150,000. Not only that, but you're going to be so healthy walking back and forth to the train station in the blizzard that uh, you're going to save $150,000 in medical expenses, so basically this house is free. That's what I call cheap washing. It's untrue. It's a lie. The people who can afford that $450,000 house, for one, are probably going to have a car, may not use a train all that much. And the people who maybe could benefit from all those things, like the rail, can't afford to buy the $450,000 house. People that don't have a car and need public transportation need cheap housing, not expensive housing with an elaborate story about justifying the price. So if you want affordable housing, it has to be your goal. You have to make it so. The price of the house is the main focus. You can have some other focuses, but you can't meet all the goals at once to the same degree. In other words, you can't have the most energy efficient house in the world with the best new equipment and have it be affordable. However, you could have a goal like, you know what? I really want my affordable houses to also be as energy efficient as possible. But affordability is what's driving it. So energy efficient as possible. And there's a lot of things that do double duty that are inexpensive and help with energy efficiency, such as insulation. You can add insulation for pennies, and yet it does have a big impact in terms of the energy efficiency. So you can't meet all your goals at once. It can't be the most beautiful, most energy efficient, most luxurious house in the world, and at the same time be affordable. But you can have more than one criteria. However, you have to have weighted criteria, what's important. So list your values in order of importance. That's value engineering. Value is what you want. You want it beautiful. That's your value. Now you try and figure out how to do it beautiful at the lowest possible cost, the most efficient way possible. Now, for me, my goals in particular, when I build affordability is number one, I'm after the lowest cost. That is my bottom line. That's my North Star. But because I sell to human beings and not chickens or, or, or barnyard animals, I have to make it marketable. It has to be pretty enough. It has to be something, you know, a homeowner can be proud of, you know, you want to invite your friends over and have them say, oh, what a nice house. Congratulations. So it has to be pretty enough. It has to be markable. And it also has to be durable. Why? I am not into durability as a moral thing. I'm not because, oh, I want to build houses that last 300 years. In other words, a la Steve Muzon. That is not my objective. I have a very, very, very practical objective for durability, which is that warranty calls will eat your lunch they will destroy your profit. If you build a cheap house that on top of being cheap is poorly built, where you haven't exercised excellent quality control, you're going to have a lousy house too. You see, if you're going to use, say, material sparing techniques, where you use the minimum amount of concrete, the minimum amount of lumber, the minimum amount of structure, you better make sure that structure is in the right place. You better make sure that concrete is poured under the right conditions. You have to exercise quality control, or you will spend any little profit you made and more on warranty calls. So I have a very practical reason for durability, and it's not moral. It's not my ideal. Now, Steps to achieving affordability, you have to design for it, you have to collaborate towards it. Of course, you have to use the new land strategies that are becoming more and more available throughout the country, and you have to build affordably. To build affordably, you have to design affordably. This is an example of a design technique that I use, which is I get the ratio of the exterior wall surface to the interior volume that that wall surface, exterior surface is enclosing or covering. Um, you see two sort of houses, 625 square feet. One of them is a square, and the square is 25 lineal feet per side, and the other is a rectangle, 50 feet by 12 and a half feet. A weird rectangular house, but I'm just trying to make a point here. They both enclose the same area, and yet one, the rectangle, uses 25% more exterior wall. That's more 25% more siding, 25% more insulation, 25% more sheathing, 25% more drywall, 25% more of everything. So it's a lot 
more expensive. Now, not all the houses are that simple, so I do a simple thing, which is I measure the exterior wall area of the house. I do this four times all around, you know, uh, length times height, and then I divide that by the interior square footage. So in my example, I divide the uh, square footage of the house by the square footage of the exterior wall, and I come up with a ratio or a result of 0.78. That means that every 0.78 um, one square foot of exterior wall will cover 0.78 square feet of interior floor area. In the square, you'll see I'm covering less interior floor area for each square foot of exterior wall. I'm trying to get as close to one as I can. One square foot of exterior wall to one square foot of interior wall area. It's impossible to do unless you're building a sphere. And the spheres are very difficult to build. They don't sell well. The uh, geodesic domes haven't really taken off uh, as far as I know. And so you end up with just simple geometric shapes like squares and rectangles. And one of my favorite shapes for a house that I built again and again using this footprint is 0.88. That's a very good ratio. I'm assured just by achieving a good floor to wall ratio that I am build, I'm designing an affordable house. The next thing I do after I got my shell, I haven't laid out the, the bedrooms or the kitchen or my beautiful living room, none of that. I've just got a shell now, a footprint. The next thing I do is, well, I go to the heart of the house or what I call the utility core, which is where all of the heavy uh, appliances, the furnaces, uh, where your plumbing, everything is going to be. And I centralize them. And I centralize them in what I call the utility core. And if you've ever seen uh, the movie, uh, The Matrix, you know, there's one part where they're fighting between walls in an old building. Old buildings used to have utility corals or, or double walls where all the pipes and all the heavy stuff ran. Why? Well, because they were using ca um, cast iron sewer pipes. They were using galvanized metal water pipes. They were using big old steel uh, ducts. And so this stuff was very difficult to snake around a house like we can do today with the flexible water pipe and with the easy plastic plumbing and all. So right now we can have a bathroom here, throw a bathroom over there, put the toilet in the other room, send the water heater over into the garage, spread everything out. And that adds a lot of cost to the construction, a lot of long runs, expensive electrical, copper lines, et cetera. So I concentrate all of that in one central location, which I call the utility core. Now, I want you to look at the house for a minute. Uh, the little three squares there on the bottom right, that is a pretty house, right? That is the house that won the, the best green built demonstration house of the year. And I designed that with Torty Gallus. We built it on a free lot in Omaha. Uh, I used all the techniques in the book. And I sold the house at cost for $90,000. It was a demonstration house to show that it can be done. But that's a very pretty house at a very low cost. If we look now, there's another technique you can use, which is to group all the wet areas, all the wet areas. I call it the wet room rectangle. We're all familiar with back-to-back -back plumbing, right? You have to have the toilets back-to-back. -back. Well, that saves you 50 bucks. But if you group all of the bathroom, all the wet areas, the kitchens, et cetera, in one tiny square, <laughs> you actually make a square. If, if, if I had, a, a say, the water heater out in the garage, I would extend my rectangle all the way out to where that water heater is. It would become gigantic in comparison to the square footage of the house. There's a fellow who invented this approach. His name is Gary Klein, and he's a hot water expert. He invented it to cut down uh, the waste uh the wasted water that we do when we turn on the faucet and wait for the water to heat up in order to shave or brush our teeth. So he, he found a technique to reduce that weight uh, by really tightening up, and he calls it the hot water uh, rectangle. But I call it the uh, wet room rectangle because it applies to all plumbing. You're really reducing the amount of plumbing that's required, the length of it. And he discovered that 67%, if you could reduce your plumbing area to 67% of the total square footage, it was kind of a sweet spot that worked really pretty well. So techniques like this that are all about design, we haven't talked about what type of pipe you're using or what kind of fixtures. We're just talking about how to lay things out. So I've laid out the shell of the house to make it affordable, centralized by heavy use things like electrical panels and, and water heaters and furnaces, and then tightened up all the plumbing areas and the areas that use uh, you know, a lot of 
pipe. Tighten these all up. These are all design principles. And this is before I begin thinking about the beautiful bedroom and where the window should go and how large the closet should be. And this is the kind of discipline you have to have to build an affordable house. Dream houses start at half a million. You know, you can actually build houses for under 100,000 if you focus on all of these things that I'm talking about. You have to also get the collaboration of everyone you work with because your subs do not think in terms of, oh, I got a lot less pipe in this house. I can charge them less. No, they use rules of thumb. Okay, we got two toilets at, at uh, $3,200 a toilet. We got three sinks and so on. In other words, they use just fixture values. You have to convince them to actually think in terms of materials and labor. And so you have to find people to collaborate with. You have to get them on board. And the main ones to get on board, believe it or not, you know, the framer is important. Everyone always brings the framer at the outset. The framer is important, but I bring them last. The ones I bring on first are my plumber, my heating and air, and my electrician. They're also the smartest guys on the crew. They're the ones you can actually talk to and have a reasonable technical conversation with. Um, and they're also the most skilled trades. So they're the most expensive. These are the ones that make a good hourly wage. Uh, they're often even somewhat sophisticated because they've been through apprenticeship programs. They kind of understand profit and things like that. So these are the guys to bring on board first. And in that discussion that's been in the cartoon there, I'm discussing going from a gas electric house to an all electric house way, way, way before all electric was cool. In fact, uh, when I did that, I did it because it costs less to build and I use an electric furnace. I mean, I published that article in Fine Home Building, a reader wrote and said, hey, you may be building the houses cheap and you may be saving money, but you're saddling your poor buyers with these horrendous utility bills. And I thought, maybe the guy's right. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm the worst of the worst. <laughs> so I called the utility company, electrical company, and said, how do my houses compare? And they had all the addresses and they ran some numbers. And it turned out that my houses were actually among the lowest electric bills in the city, even though they were all electric. Why? because they were very well insulated, which is cheap. They were very well sealed, which is caulking, cheap. I did a lot of cheap things so that I could do other cheap things. And in the long run, balance the two so that I could save money overall. Just in terms, just very quickly about uh, the prefab, you know, the idea of volumetric building, which is modular, where you take large pieces of the construction, make it off-site in a factory, and then you deliver it to the job site. You use a crane to set it all up, and and uh, then you sort of assemble it on site, and that's supposed to save you a lot of money. If you've ever done it, you know it doesn't. However, we have an idea, and this is the thing I'm currently working on with Andres, of creating what we call the wet-dry module, which is simply the kitchen and bathrooms, all in one prefabricated factory-made module that we have a factory that will make these on site. In other words, our we'll have a shed and we'll build these on site and we'll set it up like a modular factory, but it'll be a mobile one, one that can go from subdivision to subdivision. We'll build these on site and instead of using a crane, we'll use a, a forklift and a, and a flatbed to deliver them to the uh, location of the building and then set them down. That concentrates all again, what I was describing before, the plumbers, the electrician, the HVAC guys, the heavy, expensive trades, and all the expensive finished trades, cabinets, you know, the millwork, the tile, um, all of these um, expensive ex aspects of construction get built in a small factory setting where it is more efficient to build, it is less expensive to build, and then you just build the house around the module. Rather than shipping the whole house, you ship only that part which it makes sense to build in a factory. That's my response to the idea of modular and you know, prefabrication. But let's go to briefly to land use, which is something that I've actually learned from all of you. <laughs> so I probably won't say anything that you don't already know. Um, one of my favorite uh, affordable home builders is Donald McDonald in San Francisco, who built and sold $400,000 single family homes in West Beth in the center. I think that's or maybe I've got my cities confused, but an area, uh, a very tony area of San Francisco. And he did it not because he couldn't get more money, but he wanted to prove that it could be done. And he did it by building 10 houses on a single lot. And he did it by having the houses one inch apart. Because for Americans, it's very important to have a single family home with that space between the houses. So one inch was the space he used. He built 10 of them on a single lot. 
the houses are no more than 16 feet wide, and he used the discipline, no more structural member larger than a two by six. That's his biggest joist, his biggest header, his biggest uh, rafter, nothing larger than a two by six. So he used a number of self-discipline things in order to achieve the very low price of construction. This is uh, some uh, project on Finley Street Cottages by Eric Kronberg. Eric Kronberg took, I think it was two lots, divided them into four lots, and then built this kind of combination of duplexes and ADUs so that he had like um, about four units per the new lots, for the new subdivided lots. And although they are fee simple in the sense that the front duplex is a real duplex, one owner owns the whole thing, um, even though it's a duplex and it's a fee simple, he he owns the whole thing. So he rents these out and he's got a common courtyard in the back. It's a very pretty little courtyard right here. And you'll notice he does a number of things that I describe in the book. And actually Rob pointed this out to me. Um, and it's true. And Rob actually, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Eric actually read my original book and, and his house is featured on the, one of his projects is featured on the front cover. Um, he has very low roof lines, not more than four and 12 pitch. Uh, this makes some of my architectural friends very angry when I advocate for this. And uh, he's got very simple, uh, inexpensive trims and, and siding. You know, use a lot of techniques to bring down the cost uh, that are really only visible if you're looking for them, because otherwise it's just a very pretty project. Another pretty project is the Tea Light series, a series of houses that my friend Corkett Onoran did. He's very outstanding member of CNU, longtime member, urbanist advocate of CNU principles, uh, teacher at the University of uh, Colorado. And he um, he designed this project with his partner, uh, Ronnie Pallona. Their firm is called, I'm sorry, <laughs> Ronnie Pelusi. Their firm is called Pallona, combining their names. They're in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Now, you'll notice that these um uh, garages, there's six of them. We're looking at four. There's another two you can't see. They're all facing a common driveway. I calculated the concrete in this area, and it was a lot lower, like 40% lower than it would have been to have run six 25-foot long, 16-foot wide driveways out to the street, each with their own curb cut or skirt, on, which has a, an additional cost to the actual concrete driveway. Uh, this is a lot less money to do it this way. And the houses are run perpendicular rather than, um, uh, I'm sorry, run, I guess it would be, uh, yeah, perpendicular the, the, to, the, um, to the sidewalk. Let's look at the front. If you look at the, well, this is the, the entry, this is the sidewalk to enter the fronts of each of these houses. You can get three of these houses on a single um, Denver lot. Uh, that was the idea. So th each of these three houses occupies the area of one Denver lot. If you look at the houses across the street, they're the kind of traditional configuration facing the streets. These are not. These are facing each other with a kind of a common courtyard, if you will, or a little green area. Now, these houses are such that uh, there is very little yard. There's no backyard. There's very little front yard, as you can see. So where do you barbecue? Where do you put up your umbrella? You know, Where do you have an outdoor family garden uh, gathering? Well, they do it between the houses. What happens is that the one house has a exclusive use easement uh, deeded over to the house next door so that although it's two five-foot side yards, it's actually a 10-foot side yard for on one side of each house. <laughs> and then that's where you can build your deck and you can, you know, you can put out your, uh, um, your barbecue and your your outdoor table, et cetera. So this is a, a way of achieving outdoor space without actually, but still having a very, very tiny lot. Like I said, these are like maybe uh, 20, I think it was 22 by 55 or, or, or no, 34 by 55. I think that was the, uh, the size of the lots. So the houses occupy pretty much the whole lot. And this is the way that you get outdoor space. It's a very clever use of land and it reduces costs quite dramatically because in places like Denver, the land costs are very significant. So it used to be that um, the land costs made it impossible to build affordable housing, but with all the new uh, development codes and zoning codes, actually right now it's easier to get a really inexpensive lot because once you take a single family lot, even if it's 200,000 and divide it in three, well, you've got a pretty reasonable land value for each house. This is a famous house, Herbert and Catherine Jacobs' 
first house. It's known as Jacob's One. It's supposed to be the first Usonian house that Frank Lloyd Wright drew. Usonian is houses for people from the USA, <laughs> US, Usonian. Um, and he got inspired to this because of a relationship he developed with a newspaper reporter that was doing a profile on him as an architect. And this newspaper reporter really admired him as an architect. And they got into the conversation of what type of house the newspaper guy had, and he had none. He rented. Why do you rent? Well, I can't afford a house. Oh, what could you afford? Well, I could probably afford a $5,000 house. Wow, that's pretty tough, thought Frank Lloyd Wright. And then he said, so you would buy a house if it was for $5,000. And the guy said, oh, yes, um, but do you really want a $5,000 house or do you want a $10,000 house for $5,000 was the question. And that's the question always. And that's the question we first started with when you have a lot of objectives, like you want it to be, you want it to have beautiful eaves returns and you want the ornamentation just so, and you want high pitches and you want all this important stuff, but you want it to be affordable. That's wishful thinking. So he said, let me think about it. And a few days or weeks or months, I'm not sure how much time went by, Frank Lloyd Wright contacted the newspaper man and says, I think I can do it. I will sell you a $5,000 house if you're willing. And the guy said, we're willing. That's what we want. That's what we need. Of course, he was honored to have a house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank charged him $500 to design the house. It's actually kind of a hefty fee for the <laughs> relative to the price of the house. But um, it was his first Usonian house. And in fact, he delivered it to uh, Herbert and Catherine Jacobs for $5,000. Many compromises went into this house. It's a pretty house. Of course, Frank Lloyd Wright, he's a genius. Most of us are not Frank Lloyd Wright. So we can't necessarily pull off what he pulled off in terms of the combination of high aesthetics, high value, and innovation. This house, you'll notice, has a gravel driveway. It has no foundation. It's just a slab on top of the grade, what we would call now a shallow frost protected footing. Um, it has many, many, many compromises in terms of interior floor space that were very unusual for the time. But the result was he was able to deliver a $5,000 house. This, close your eyes, okay, only open them if you're willing to see an ugly house, is the modern version of that house. I love this house in the same sense that some people love brutalism, some people love a lot of the 20th century modern houses, which are have a wonderful concept behind them. They're actually quite ugly. It's a lot of them are, to me, quite ugly. There's a lot of ugly architecture that architects and highfalutin uh, builders and realtors and people with good taste and knowledge appreciate only because it accomplished what it set out to accomplish. You know, like form follows function. Well, form follows function doesn't necessarily equal beautiful. It is form follows function. It's something that expresses what that building is for. And um, this building is for only one thing. This building is for low-cost housing. It was designed in every respect for low cost of construction. The builder, Peterson Construction, was famous for knowing not only um, their floor plans, but how many nails it took to build the house. They were in very tight control of the inventory to build this house. 2,500 of them are still in existence and still occupied by people who love their house. And why do they love the house? Because people typically do not buy a house from the outside in. We talk about curb appeal, right? It's nice to have pretty houses. That's great. But when people go out there to buy a house, especially at the affordable level, they really buy it once they step inside of it. And this is a very nice floor plan. A million things are done to make it inexpensive. For example, it has no ductwork. It has just one giant plenum, which is a little space beneath the slab where, where the forced air unit, the furnace, blows uh, hot air. It didn't used to have an air conditioning when it was built. Blows hot air down into this underneath the slab, and then there are little holes in the slab where the hot air comes up to warm each room. So many, many, many techniques used to make this house inexpensive to build. 2,500 of them exist. I've talked to people that live in these houses, and they adore them. They love them. It's very livable. If you have a beautiful exterior but the floor plan is unlivable, people will not buy it. They will, they will prefer a livable floor plan. Maybe a lot of you listening will <laughs> make that same decision because you're very aware of and concerned with and all of that, the exterior of the house, 
the the block face or the appearance of the the massing has to be just right the roof pitches have to be the ornamentation but the regular guy the regular family really wants a livable plan i don't know if you've ever been to a mobile home you go into a mobile home it looks terrible from the outside on the inside you go in there and you say wow i could live here this is really nice this is unexpected and those people know what they're doing they know who they're selling to. They know what it is that motivates people to buy. And it's the floor plan. And, and we and should probably get the you, questions if you're... Yeah. I just wanted to show you in closing that although this is my philosophy, it's not what I do because I also have a aesthetic side to my personality and I'm an art school graduate. So these are examples of what my affordable homes look like. These are about 125 thousand dollar houses when I built them. It was refugee relocation housing. That's why there's all those flags. We gave everybody a U.S. flag and a flag from the country of origin during the opening day. But they're pretty. I wanted to leave you with a nice image. Thanks and sorry for going over. Fernando, uh, thank you very much. That was excellent. Uh, we will get to Q&A uh, very shortly. And I wanted to mention we'll, we'll go over the the hour. Um, uh, for those who have to leave, we will be posting the video uh, uh, tomorrow and on the CNU website. So if your question is answered after the hour and you have to leave, you can see the answer. Uh, you can see that it responded to at that point. Um, but I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, Fernando, before we sure. get to the Q&A. And um, uh, one is that... Um, is that uh, you recommend that builders try designing a house that is as cheap as possible, um, then walk it back a little bit, add a few things to make it look better, maybe a few luxuries. Uh, talk about this approach a little bit, please. Yeah, well, I always try and think in terms of how inexpensively can I build this? And I focus on that until I've achieved it. Uh, then there's usually a little added latitude to upgrade. And, and I do that because, again, I'm building for human beings. But I will tell you a, a kind of a design 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 discipline that you can do, especially if you're an architect or designer, which is to read uh, Chapter uh, 2 of the International Building Residential Building Code. Chapter 2 is the design chapter. It tells you everything that's required in a house. And by def just simply by omission, everything that's not required in a house read that chapter and design the minimal house that will comply with the residential code. For example, a bedroom needs a window of a certain size for egress, for firemen to be able to come in and get you out in the fire, but it does not require a closet. It doesn't require a ceiling light fixture. A switched outlet is enough. You know, a hallway doesn't have to be any more than three feet long. There's minimum standards and if you apply every minimum standard to your design and omit anything that's not required you're going to have an extremely affordable house and it's a great discipline it's an exercise it doesn't mean you're going to build that house it just means that now you've really learned this is the stick figure this is the essence of what i'm doing and i can go down and i bet you if you did build that house incidentally you would sell it <laughs> you would sell it because that's how deep the hunger is for affordability. But I think it's a great exercise. And I do recommend builders uh, do that uh, and that um, designers uh, do the exercise that I just described. I've done it. And it, it's an interesting exercise to see what you can do without exceeding, without adding one thing that the code doesn't require. Okay. Uh, um, the other question that I wanted to ask was that affordability, uh, is has a regional component mm -hmm. that um, regions uh, vary tremendously in terms of how affordable they are. How much does where you work matter and uh, how does that factor into your thinking in terms of designing an affordable house? Well, it matters a lot, of course. Um, and one of the, uh, in, in that slide I showed where the Urban Land Institute was talking about the crisis in housing, one of the paragraphs in there describes that immigration um, now that our population is not growing, it's not growing because people aren't having kids and it's not growing because we're not allowing immigrants in. So our population is sort of stagnated right now. So there isn't population growth to feed, uh, you know, the, 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 the market for, or, or 
the new housing uh, sector. What there is, is migration within the United States. People are moving, you know, from California to Texas or from, uh, you know, wherever it is that they're leaving or New York to Oklahoma. Maybe I don't know where they're going, but people are moving around and you will definitely be able to build affordable housing a lot less expensively in Houston than you can in San Francisco or New York, for sure. Uh, so geographic uh, component is a big component of the, you know, the, the, the price of housing in part because of land, also availability of labor. You know, there's a ton of labor in Houston. There's very little labor in other places. So that's very important. However, you're always thinking relative to the market. Uh, I talked about Donald McDonald, who was building $450,000 single family homes, well, in, in theory, in quotes, in um, San Francisco. Well, $450,000 house in um, Omaha is an expensive house. It's a pricey house. It's a very nice house. So, of course, it varies. And it's always relative to where you are. See, Donald McDonald could have sold that house for $850,000. He didn't because he wanted to show the city that it could be done. He wanted to, you know, make a point. He was, he was, he, he wrote a book called the, the. It was like a manifesto on on uh, uh, on, on affordable home building and such. So he's that, that kind of a guy, but it is always relative, and so that's what you're that's what you're trying to achieve. And in, in one place, you're really affordable house. Like I saw affordable housing in Vail, Colorado, for seven hundred and fifty thousand. Um, so, you know, yes, there's a big regional component, uh, a lot of which has to do with local labor availability, cost of living, and hence the cost of labor, and of course, land values. Um, the zoning, by the way, the, the new, the, all the new allowances in zoning, like here, you know, here in Houston, we can build up to six uh, ADUs on a single lot. And the, the front ADU can be commercial because there's no zoning. So there isn't anything that says that you can't have a shop in a residential neighborhood. So you can actually really easily create a uh, mixed use development simply out of ADUs where your front ADU is, is commercial and the back ADUs are all residential. So those the new zoning that's happening, you know, there's like 20 states right now introducing major changes in terms of, you know, single family definitions, getting rid of single family zoning, doing a lot of things that facilitate, you know, taking that land value and, and reducing its impact on the single dwelling. Um, how do you define affordability? Um, uh, uh, one uh, of the viewers asks, uh, that it's often defined um, in terms of paying no more than 30% of net income mm -hmm. on a mortgage. But do you define it differently? No, I define it exactly that way. I define it at, you know, 80% of median, et cetera. But that's because I'm really striving for affordable housing in the true definition of the word, i.e. the least expensive housing in the city. Uh, other people are not. They, they talk about attainable housing. In other words, they don't want to have put that much effort into the cost part of the house and they they talk about attainable attainable is like the step above affordable where there's enough people that can buy it you know middle class people can buy it um and so you kind of have to define it according to what you're you know what you want to achieve but i should tell you even if you're building very expensive housing um there's no reason to use excess materials uh, when you don't need to i i like the uh technique of what it's called shallow frost protected footings you know that foundations often have to have a depth below frost because the frost will make the foundation heave and crack and all that so they have to go down deeper into the soil to a level where the frost won't be able to act on the foundation that's the way it's always been done the traditional way but as of frank lloyd wright invented shallow frost protected foundations which are a way of insulating the foundation to keep the warmth of the house and the ground underneath the foundation warm enough so that it will not freeze. And so suddenly an area like where I would build in Omaha, a couple of houses I showed where I have 60 inches to get down to frost depth, I'm able to do it with 14 inches. Big difference in how much concrete you use in a 60 inch footing versus a 14 inch deep footing. And it's much more energy efficient because you have all of that insulation around your foundation. So sometimes you know, you can combine things in order to, uh, uh, you know, achieve higher values on, on more than just the economic front. And that was Wisconsin in the 1930s. It was yeah. very cold there and it's obviously worked out well for uh, the better part of a century. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we got a question uh, about um, 
about demographic trends, um, less than 10 years away from the youngest baby boomers being 70 years old, there's going to be a massive decline in the largest ever population. We should expect some kind of whiplash with supply, supply overcoming demand. Instead of getting people inside of tiny footprint houses, should we be planning on absorbing and retrofitting McMansions? Um, yes, I would agree with that. Uh, I saw neighborhoods in LA after the great uh, recession there, I think it was 89, something like that. Um, there was, they weren't quite McMansions like today's, but they were McMansions for the time. Uh, neighborhoods uh, that were eventually occupied entirely by uh, Hispanic uh, families, large Hispanic families. I grew up in a very large house because we had a million people in it. I mean, we just had cousins and uncles and aunts and everything. So we didn't each have a lot of square footage. We had a lot, of, lot less square footage back then than I do now, but there was just a lot of people in the house. So I think that's a, a, a very good point to make and a very difficult one to achieve because those McMansion neighborhoods want to preserve their property values and they don't want it to become a slum, which is what it you know, what they would interpret as if, if, if the houses had many, you know, multi-generation or different families, unrelated people living in them. I, I don't think of it that way at all. And I think you're right on. I think absolutely that's something that can and, and should be happening, but I think it's a ways away. And it's not something that national home builders can do or people that, you know, they're, they're, we also need a lot and a lot more housing, it, it, you know, right now. So I think it's a combination of both. Do you have any recommendations for building affordably in historically row house neighborhoods? Well, I would build uh, row houses are are historically affordable. Uh, you know, our row housing was constructed because of its affordability. Um, they're typically much narrower. Uh, the common wall, you know, often provides uh, structure insulation. Uh, they're more efficient if you're in the middle of a row house. You, you're going to have very little, uh, you know, exterior wall exposure. Uh, so there's many benefits to row housing. And and yes, I, I don't see why, I don't understand the question clearly in the sense of um, you can build townhouses under the IRC. You know, if they're all fee simple, separate houses, you can group them together. It doesn't have to just be a duplex. It can be a fourplex. It can be a sixplex. Not if they're up and down. Uh, as soon as you put them up and down and you try and make a fourplex, like, you know, two, like uh, maybe, maybe two units up and two units down or four units up and four units down, you run into problems with having to go to the uh, the building code rather than the residential code, which forces you to have sprinklers, et cetera. Uh, so there are some issues with multifamily, small multifamily, what we used to call, um, you know, what, like what like a, a, a local landlord might own a fourplex or a sixplex or something on two or three floors. But row houses, I, there's really no, no, no real problem with that if they're two uh, stories or less. Uh, if you're up to three stories and 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 more, then you you will end up with uh, sprinkler requirements and all for for fire safety, and that makes it quite a bit more expensive. So I think it's you have to decide on the design that you can build affordably, if that's what you're you know if that's what you're trying to achieve. They're they're historically affordable housing type, and so yes. just the, the, use the same techniques as you you would use in your other houses, uh, but applying to that housing type? Yes, exactly. Exactly. What kinds of cladding are you using um, most often over the foam cladding that you described? Well, I tell you, I have used different claddings. Uh, the, the house that I was describing where I saved that $4,000 in, in foam, I used um, a smart siding, smart side, which is a, uh, a an engineered uh, wood pulp siding, if you will. It's similar to, you know, like the um, um, fiber cement sidings and such, except that it doesn't crack so easily. It's a little less expensive, less heavy. Um, it's great if you use uh, sheets of it with batten and board. It's a very nice uh, finish. Uh, so I've used that. I've used a lot of vinyl siding. The problem with a lot of vinyl siding is that you, you actually need uh, the sheathing underneath it. And so you can't uh, sometimes use it. Uh, however, when you're doing the the uh, gyp board interior uh, structure, you're at 16 inches on center. You're, you can't do it at 24 inches on center. So you sacrifice that extra stud um, with um, 
you know, in trading for the uh, the outside sheathing. And with that foam board over top of it, there's a lot of sidings that you can nail up at 16 inches on center. But I like a solid siding if you're going to go over foam because there's not a lot of protection there. You know, between the exterior and the interior of the house, if you take a sledgehammer to a vinyl-sided house with foam, you're going to, the sledgehammer is going to end up in the living room. So you, you, I do want something a little bit more sturdy on the exterior when I'm using that approach. A lot of times I use vinyl siding. In Los Angeles, I use stucco. You know why? Stucco is a very nice material. It was the least expensive in Los Angeles. It'd be very expensive in other. In Houston, it's kind of expensive. In in in, in Santa Fe, it's not. So you have to kind of decide that locally. What is the siding that a lot of people know how to put up, and there's a lot of competition for for the labor price of that siding. Somebody from Asheville uh, uh, talks about uh, they've completed a missing middle housing study. Mm -hmm. Uh, that concludes that single family is the most expensive housing mm -hmm. typology. And uh, um, so he is asking, what um, have you found that duplexes, triplexes, et cetera, and other missing middle in general can be less expensive? Uh, they are. I've built a lot of duplexes and fourplexes. I, I built, um, I, I've always built them though, I should say, as um, fee simple, you know, like a row, um, uh, not really duplexes in the sense of one owner owns both sides, but rather duplexes in the sense of two owners. Uh, and I've done that because I built in college towns and the families would buy the whole thing and then rent it out. And that's how they paid for the student housing during the four years of, of college. But um, uh, when you do it that way, of course, you, you've got all the utility impacts because you've got two sets of, of, of you know, uh, of the water service and electrical service. If you build a real duplex, i.e., a two family house that uh, one, a one owner, be simple, one owner owns both sides, you can save quite a bit of money. And it's actually now becoming a popular type. At the time that I was doing that, um, it really wasn't. It was even a little hard to sell duplexes. People wanted single family homes. But I think it's the best approach, really. And I think fourplexes are even better. Um, so I, I agree with that, especially because you can make them narrow. And the narrowness helps a lot to control costs. So uh, yes, they are less expensive, although they're not, nothing is a magic bullet. It isn't like you, you put them together and now they cost half as much as they would to build apart. It's more like it costs 12% less. You know, it's, it's, it's a small difference. And that, and, and the type also impacts the value. So you may, it may cost you 12% less, but it's worth 20% less. You know, sometimes it's not a, a really good relationship between the two, only because of the perception that people want a single family home. They want space between their neighbor. That's just a, you know, that's just a kind of a, a, a quirk or a malady of our culture. It's not necessarily anything to do with the, with the architecture or the building type. We had a question about the utility module that you, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, somebody noticed that there was a seven foot ceiling and they wanted to know why. Well, because uh, good, good question and very observant. Um, the seven, it's actually an eight foot ceiling, but the the ceiling in that area is dropped in the kitchen is dropped to seven feet because that's where the um, air conditioning equipment is. Uh, have you ever, you know, if you've been to a hotel, sometimes you notice that there's an area of the hotel room that's lower than everything else. If you look up, you'll see that there's kind of a, uh, a trap door in the ceiling, if you will, an area where you can tell, well, that's an access panel of some kind. Well, that's because the, the, the heat pump or the air conditioning equipment is up in that ceiling. And that's how it is in that module. The, the heating and air is up between the ceiling and and the roof joists, if you will, uh, it occupies that space. So that's why it's seven feet. It's actually, by the way, you, you can build seven feet uh, tall ceilings by the building code. It's one of the things you might observe if you do the exercise I recommended with chapter two. However, it doesn't save you money because it's very hard to get, you know, you have to cut every stud by hand and then the drywall doesn't work and all. You're better off going eight feet. So in this case, it's a drop ceiling. Okay. Um, uh, a question, uh, how does affordable house construction compared to office to residential tower conversion costs? Do you have any idea about that? I, I understand. Well, the problem with um, tower or office to residential um, 
conversions is that the uh, typically the depth is too big in offices. In other words, it, it, they end, you would end up, it, it's very hard to create corridors and then have reasonable apartment lengths, if you will. You'd have very, very long apartments. You don't have enough windows. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of special problems with office uh, to residential conversions. Um, that are, are are unique to the the fact that the office wasn't designed for residences, and there's and then there's issues like you don't have enough, you know, the zoning issues, uh, like you have to have a certain amount of backyard or front yard or something with if you're doing a residential tower or res, or multifamily, and you don't have it in the office because it was never required, and so now you have to go through all these uh, special permits and variances and such that complicate the process. So that I, I understand that there's a strong movement towards it. Um, and I have done, uh, and I have done uh, some of it. Um, uh, it is, uh, it's challenging. Now, a very old office sometimes is, is they're not, you know, those old industrial buildings that were converted to residential lofts. Those were much easier to do actually, because they were not as long. They were not as deep. Uh, they didn't rely so much on artificial light. You know, they had to have windows. And, and so it was, it's easier to do on an old building, let's say that on a more modern one. Can you talk any more about any other advanced framing provisions when using the foam sheathing? Um, well, I've talked a little bit. You're going to be at 16 inches on center rather than 24 inches on center, which is a typical advanced uh, framing. Um, I uh, had an engineer on my project, and we were able to show that the uh, application of the joint compound at the joints provided sufficient stiffness that we didn't need to have blocking at the joints. The way that the drywall is installed is horizontally. So the sheets are like four feet tall, and they may be you know, 12, 16 feet long. Uh, and so these are nailed up. Uh, they're nailed up every seven inches along the studs, along the bottom. And supposedly, sometimes the building inspector will require that you block between all the studs and then nail those two, um, you know, where the, where the joint is between the two sheets at seven inches too. However, um, showing some research that's been done up in Canada, the, the actual mud, the actual joint compound and the application of tape and joint compound gives a structural value to that joint such that you don't actually need to do that. Uh, so that's one sort of caveat that you may or may not run into that complicates it a little bit. Um, the, the main, uh, there aren't really any other uh, differences in terms of the framing, except that you have to use lead-in um, bracing you know, you might use lead embracing, which is that diagonal, uh, you know, the old style where they would uh, carve a piece of uh, diagonal one by four uh, in a, in, into the uh, into the framing. And so at certain points, you may have to do that. You'll have to use some of that. Uh, there are some alternatives now that you can use, you know, metal versions of it that you just nail up. Uh, but you will have to use a little bit of diagonal. Uh, you may have to use a little bit of diagonal bracing, depending on what your uh, brace ball requirements are. Uh, I, I avoided that, for example, on the portal walls, which is the garage walls where you have a three-car garage and you have these very narrow. I used, I just used OSB there because it was easier <laughs> than doing some complicated thing. So there are points at which you might uh, just go ahead and, and use standard cheating in the building and other points where you don't. Um, like if you have a very short section of wall with a very severe um, you know, wind impact, you may you do it there. You, you do, though, reduce your OSB either by 100% or 90% uh, or your exterior wood sheathing if you prefer plywood, you know, it's plywood or OSB. Um, it's a big cost, and there isn't really that much of a complication uh, 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 to it unless you have a complicated building. Uh, when I showed you mine, you, you saw that it was kind of stepped in the back. It had a lot of zigs and zags in it, and it, that complicated a little bit. You can also use interior walls, by the way, as part of your brace walling and use that uh, technique, and, and that can sometimes alleviate the stresses on the exterior walls. This sounds like this is a pretty technical <laughs> answer. I apologize. <laughs> you asked a technical question. Um, uh, and another question, it's a little bit more general, but uh, may get into some technical aspects, but uh, a viewer noted that building codes tended to require tend to require the use of 19th century technology in the 21st century. Has this gotten better, and what can we do to accelerate the acceptance of modern technology? I, I don't know what you mean by modern technology, but the building code gets thicker and thicker every year because things are added to it versus 
taken away from it. Uh, I think it's an advantage that there's a lot of 19th century technology in the building code. I use it uh, because the modern technology tends to be driven by special interests in the sense that it's a company that's trying to sell a product. You know, like maybe it's um, Uber, Uber. And they want to use sell the zip system sheathing or the Advantech uh, floor sheathing, and so they create all these requirements on on deflection and on things that their product will meet, but the standard products are the what what I call the um, commodity based products, you know, that aren't branded. They're just like rice, drywall. <laughs> um, it's um it's not a uh, um it, nobody in particular there's a there's there are people that manufacture it that have no name um but um uh so i i think the 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 older parts of the code are a lot of times the the ones that are the best as far as new technology are you talking about things like uh well uh, we want to be able to introduce this new type of sip system or structural insulated panel that uses a, a a special type of urethane foam on the interior and then has a special exterior skin or these but well there's a lot of that uh, a lot of things are being invented every day there's and those things are um allowed in the code uh the building code doesn't say you can't do that it's just that if it's not a standard thing that they can do prescriptively see the the, the residential code is meant so that a builder can build a house without an architect without an engineer just following the prescriptions and others the paint by number do it this way and you can do it you won't have to we don't have to we don't have to uh you know redesign we don't have to reinvent the wheel we know this works so that's the intent of the international residential code not the intent of the building code the building code is a design code you have to prove it works you have to have a set of plans and your engineer has to do all these calculations to prove this thing works now you can use that approach with the residential code as well and uh, and it's called uh, alternative means and methods. And there's a section of the code that deals with alternative means and methods. So basically, anything you want to do, you want to build with rubber tires piled up. You want to, you know, th that's how things like, um, you know, how do things like straw bale? Hold hold on a second, please. Hold on. I apologize. Well. Looks like we're getting to the uh, we're getting to the end of our discussion. When Fernando gets back, I want to thank everybody for uh, being part of this. And uh, we may take one more question, but um, uh, this has been uh, certainly an interesting discussion. I can stay on if anyone wants to. I apologize. I just got off very quickly because I I'm uh, I'm I'm actually at a at a, a job site <laughs> and okay. some guys started drilling. So I, I thought, oh, this is gonna not going to be very good for okay. our sound. Well, quality. maybe we can take one more question. And then, uh, but I wanted to thank, but I thanked everybody for being part of this. And uh, thank you, Fernando. But uh, somebody asked if you had any thought on tiny homes. Any thoughts uh, on tiny Yeah, homes? thoughts on tiny homes. Well, tiny, real tiny homes are about 400 square feet. A lot of things are described as tiny homes. The Lennar homes I showed, the guy I described in North Carolina building 800 square foot houses. Those are small homes. They're not tiny homes. And I prefer small homes because tiny homes are kind of like uh, RVs. And so they're, they're expensive per square foot to build. They can be certainly less expensive to build than a full-on house, especially if they're on a trailer, you know, the mobile the, the tiny homes on wheels. Tiny homes are in the building uh, code. You can certainly build them. People have done successful developments using tiny homes, but they're for very specific populations. For example, single retired people or homeless vets, you know, things like that, where th these are folks that can really live within the size of a hotel room. So it, it is a very niche product for very specific things. And I know it's become very, very popular, but it's a somewhat punitive way of living. Uh, so a small house, it gives a little room for two bedrooms, for two baths, for a closet, for things like that. Uh, and I, and I prefer that, although, I, Hey, I'm building a tiny home right now. And I owned a tiny home for many, 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 many years that was right next to a railroad track. And yet it was my best rental. <laughs> I'd rented within 24 hours because it was the least expensive rental in the city. And people just love the idea of having their own home, even if it was really tiny. That's how hungry people are for affordable single family homes. And I know we hate single family homes and we want missing middle, but for the most part, people want a single family home. 
Well, we will end with that. And thank you very much for this excellent discussion, Fernando. I really appreciate it. I hope people buy your book, Building an Affordable House, second edition. Um, uh, so uh, please go out and, uh, and pick up his book. He won't be sorry. There's some excellent stuff in there. And uh, so everybody you. have a great day. And I would thank everybody for attending. Thank you for having me. Okay. Take care.